If you could pass up your questions, and I will try to group the questions by related uh, questions. And that way we, we have about 20 minutes. We, I think we can uh, work through most of the questions. Uh, let me just say, uh, say uh, as um, a starting point, um, uh, Sierra Club has uh, recognized uh, and learned uh, over the past several years, and we do recognize that uh, producing natural gas is uh, dirty, dangerous, and uh, uh, really unnecessary, and we should try to minimize the use of natural gas uh, as, as best as we can. Uh, we do uh, worry about climate change, uh, and that is uh, why we entered into the Beyond Coal campaign and trying to reduce the use of all fossil fuels. Uh, uh, we are working on ways to produce uh, 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 energy in a, using renewables and using uh, cleaner technologies. Uh, let me just uh, ask uh, uh, Dr. The, the, the industry talks about uh, reducing its own uh, methane emissions uh, with the so-called low-hanging fruit. And are there particular ways that the uh, gas production can be uh, made, uh, you know, be cleaner in, in, in that, that, that uh, you know of? That's an excellent question, Tom. Um, so it comes down to can the industry get that part of the process right the industry is always saying we can get it right, and regulators and legislators and organizations are saying, well, maybe we can, they can, we can force them to get it right. Well, there are a lot of things they've got to get right. We've talked about some of them today, but let's just talk about the question that, that Tom just asked. What can the industry do to decrease emissions of methane, uh, accidental emissions and voluntary emissions? So I think I have a slide here that I'd like to use to address that. Let me see if I can find it. Okay, as you well know, the gas industry is a capitalistic enterprise. That's good. It's the way we work in this country. The, the industry thrives on profit, and it doesn't thrive when it doesn't make any money. So to ask the question, what can industry do to reduce emissions, the answer is they have to spend money. They have to do business not as usual. I think that's obvious. They have to, redu they have to do reduced emission completions on every well. Let me explain what that means, two parts to it. Specialized equipment capable of separating gas from liquids at high flow rates and high pressure has to be brought to the site. Personnel trained in using that equipment have to be available. And a pipeline has to be available. Okay, those three things have to exist for a reduced emission completion to occur. There are at this point, according to the American Petroleum Industry, industry this is the American Petroleum Industry, not my number, 300 reduced emission completion units in the United States, 300. There will be 35,000 oil and gas wells drilled in the United States this year. Those 300 units can possibly service a third of them. Two thirds of them will not have reduced emission completions. So what should the industry do? They should build, buy, and require reduced emission, no. What should the state of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania do? The Pennsylvania should rewrite its regulations and say no oil and gas well development in the state of Pennsylvania without reduced emission completions. And if that means the companies have to go out and buy new REC equipment, so be it, because that's the right thing to do. <laughs> All right, how about the leaks from valves, fittings, et cetera, et cetera, the incidental stuff? Use high quality materials, use high quality personnel. How about the compressor stations? Well, there are techniques that can diminish blowdown activity. Uh, there are various tools and associated flanges, gaskets, and valves, and pumps, and compressor stations that are less leaky. Uh, what should they do about transmission lines? Replace those that leak. What should they do about distribution lines? Repair those, or replace those that leak. What's the common theme behind everything I just said? Okay. So here's the story, folks. This is the latest paper out of MIT. Uh, this came out about a month ago. It makes an estimate of break-even price for 2009 wells uh, for the various shale plays around the country. So let's look at Marcellus. So uh, 
estimating the initial production at 3,500,000 ,000 cubic feet per day, the typical Marcellus well in Pennsylvania. The break even price is $4. Current price of natural gas is 230, $235. Okay, so companies are losing money producing natural gas, dry natural gas. They're making money producing natural gas in conjunction with natural gas liquids, including oil. As you well know, the rigs are leaving eastern Pennsylvania. There are 10 rigs fewer in Pennsylvania this week than there were last week. Where are they going? Ohio. Ohio. Why? <coughs> Liquid gas. Okay. I've got natural gas liquids. So the point I'm making here is that on one hand, to drastically decrease emissions, new equipment, new, 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 personnel, new personnel training, and repair of existing infrastructure has to occur, and it all costs money. If you have money to burn, you might invest in it if you see this is a long-term activity. I'm not convinced that this is a long-term activity. And I'm not convinced that when they're losing $1.50 per thousand that they're going to go out of their way to buy all the new equipment and repair all the infrastructure unless they are forced to. Okay. There have been a number of questions about naturally occurring methane from cows, from agriculture, um, and other natural sources. How does that compare to uh, emissions from the gas industry? Just happen to have a slide on that one, too. <laughs> okay, so a, a common reaction I get when I talk, talk about methane emissions is that, but Professor Graff, everybody knows that there's more natural gas being emitted into the atmosphere from cows than from natural gas development. That used to be true. Okay, there, there are natural sources of methane coming out of the ground and coming out of animals. But that's no longer true. The latest inventories from the EPA published late last year show that now the largest source of methane emissions in the United States by far is the natural gas industry. Okay. And as of last year, about 19% of that source of natural gas, methane, from the natural gas industry was from unconventional development from shales. And the EIA, the Energy Information Administration, predicts that whereas now only about 20% of our natural gas is coming from shales, Within 30 years, something like 50% of it is going, to come from is going to come from shales, which means the percentage of methane that we're putting into the atmosphere, keeping everything constant, is going to continue to increase in the difference between natural sources of methane, animal, agriculture, um, permafrost melting, is going to increase, is going to, going to stay the same, and the amount coming from natural gas production is going to increase. I would point out then, speaking of these feedback mechanisms, these uncontrollable things. If we continue to produce more natural gas from shale, we increase the amount of methane in the United States coming from natural gas production, which means we exacerbate climate change, which means we continue to increase average earth temperature, which means we exacerbate melting of permafrost, which increases methane into the atmosphere, and then we have bad things happening. So I'm sorry I couldn't find that actual data, but I can, we, Professor Haworth and I just submitted, at the request of the White House, um, a climate change assessment paper. They, the White House asked for such papers from a variety of sources. And so we teamed up with Drew Shindell at NASA and a bunch of other people around the world and wrote what we think is a summary of all the peer-reviewed science on this question, uh, including the latest estimates from the inventories from the EPA. And I will be glad to point you to that paper as soon as I can find it. It's not on this laptop. Uh, we have a uh, bunch of questions about fin finance and the economics of the industry. Um, the industry uh, talks about being economically driven, um, that is, the, the demand for natural gas, for home heating, for electricity, for in uh, industrial process, uh, plus the desire to export um, natural gas in uh, liquid form, uh, liquid natural gas. Uh, so the question is, you know, if, if this is being economically driven, uh, how can we prevent uh, 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 
the, the, how can we change the dynamics of the industry? Well, wow. okay, that's slightly, no, it's way out of my area of expertise. I'm not an energy economist. I'll say something probably naive and simple. An in, in industry, any industry is going to respond first to the economics that that industry finds itself involved in, and secondarily to regulation, uh, which might be in its economic best interest, might not be. So in this case, where there is a profound chaotic dynamic effect in the industry economically, even the, I don't think even the industry realized it was gonna be in this condition now. Um, prices are so low, volume is so high, demand keeps decreasing, how do, they, how do you control economically what the, what the industry can do? I don't know. Uh, I, mean, I guess if we all turn off our gas stoves and turn off our gas heat and immediately switch to renewables, that sends a very strong message economically to the industry, but we're not going to be able to do that overnight, but we should have started it 30 years ago and we should all be actively engaged in it now. Regulation, there are some states <laughs> where regulation is better than it was, but it's still not where, in my opinion, it should be. There are some states, I think that's north, right? <laughs> there are some states where the regulations are still being developed and there is no shale gas development and hopefully there will never be. Uh, so that sends a very strong economic message. Good question. Uh, the number of questions about what happens to gas wells after they stop producing, uh, whether there are uh, continual um, migration effects, uh, health effects, and whether it's possible to uh, uh, you know, test people's waters long after uh, drinking water, I guess, long after the uh, wells have stopped producing. Well, this goes back, it's a very important question. Um, and it goes back to the, uh, the comment I made about the statistics that the industry publishes itself on the integrity of, of wells over a long period of time. And as those of you who were here last night heard um, Lori Barr talking about her fantastic volunteer efforts, heroic efforts to go out and locate abandoned gas and oil wells. Um, so yes, the answer is it is certainly plausible that if a young well fails and causes contamination of an underground source of drinking water, that failure of an older well can do the same thing. That's certainly plausible. In, in fact, it's highly more, even high, more highly likely. And I want to point out that uh, I was inspired by what I heard yesterday from Lori, and I had a slide, which I will find here in a minute, that shows an actual example of what happens when one company drills and fracks into a region where they were not aware that there was an existing abandoned gas well. Let's see if I can find it. Let's see. This is November 2010, just so you know what you're looking at here. This is a well being fracked. This is the well being fracked, and this is the effluent of the frac fluid coming out of an abandoned gas well that was 150 feet away that they didn't know about. So has it happened? Yeah. That thing spewed for two weeks. Okay. And um, the uh, Texas Railroad Commission made some very interesting comments about it. Yeah. So I show this slide in New York. We're lucky in New York. We only have 35,000 wells that have been abandoned and lost. I think the number in Pennsylvania is over 100,000 abandoned and lost wells. So, the, and, and since you're gonna have over 100,000 Marcellus wells, lucky New York is only gonna get maybe 60,000. The probability of one of your new Marcellus wells doing something like this, uh, which would certainly bring the flat, frac fluid to the surface in an uncontrolled manner and would expose surface waters and ground waters to frac fluid and whatever else it picked up on the way back up, contamination, the probabilities are real. Um, I did find this slide I was, wanted to show you before about the, quest, the previous question on where's the methane coming from. So uh, 
right now, natural gas systems are producing about 39% of all the U.S. total methane emissions. Animal agriculture. So, when people, you know, when you're when you're having your coffee cup, your coffee club debates, or your um, break debates, or your lunch debates at the office with people who are pro drilling, and they say this is all bullshit because it's mostly from bulls. Uh, pardon my French. That's no longer true. Um, and by, by the way, on the, uh, the um, slide we had, the, the water, uh, the frac fluid gushing out, mm -hmm. I think in, um, in the state I've heard it called inadvertent release. Yeah. Inadvertent release. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, there are a number of questions about um, uh, shallow, uh, I guess, clarification about uh, shallow gas wells and whether um, the, those cause uh, the methane migration as well as, um, as the um, unconventional wells. Um, if I interpret the question correctly, I'll rephrase it. Is it possible for any oil, gas, water, geothermal, for any well to cause, to have happen, methane migration into an underground source of drinking water? The answer is yes. Okay, all, all the material I talked to you about cementing and cementing problems, that material is not just applicable to shale gas wells. So the startling thing is that over the past few years in Pennsylvania, our attention has been focused on shale gas wells and their effect on contamination of underground sources of drinking water, people's private water wells, when it's been happening all the time. Okay, all those other hundreds of thousands of conventional oil and gas wells in Pennsylvania had cement jobs. They had casing, they had cement jobs. And they were failing at the rates that I showed you. So I think it's amazing that only because of the um, heightened attention that we're giving to shale gas development that we come to notice that a lot of people have been affected by this. So the direct technical answer to your question is it doesn't matter whether the well is shallow, vertical, deep oil, gas, if the well transects an underground source of high-pressure methane, and if that high-pressure methane finds a way through the drilling of the well, the casing of the well, the cementing of the well to migrate upwards, it will. And there's, the industry does everything it can to stop that. It's in the industry's best interest to seal a well with cementing. But cementing has been the single most deep penetrating, painful, bloody thorn in the side of the gas industry since they started drilling wells. Very, very bright people working for very good corporations using the very best technology have tried their best to solve that problem. And what you see in the statistics is the best they can do. Don't expect there to be a miracle silver bullet breakthrough over the next couple years that says, wow, we finally fixed the gas migration problem. Uh, last week, Schlumberger announced the new product. So they add another additive to their cement mixture, which when it comes into contact with a hydrocarbon, activates and seals micro cracks. That's a great idea. That's amazing. That's, that's a product of our nanobiotechnology revolution. They figured out what new additive to add to the cement and the water and the anti-shrinking stuff that they already put in it so that if the cement starts to leak and hydrocarbons come in contact with this material, the material activates and tries to seal cracks. Great idea. It'll, it'll probably knock a tenth of a percent off that statistic because it's expensive and not everybody will use it and it won't work in every circumstance and it might not seal all the micro cracks and there might be a major crack that it can't seal. These are engineering things. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But the point I'm making is the industry industry has been trying for 100 years to get perfect seals in their wells. And the best they can do is the, is the, is the statistics that they currently have. There will be only marginal improvements. You can point to any one company and its record and say, look at that, we've been lucky. Chesapeake was laughing all the way to the bank over Cabot. I was at an EPA meeting in, in DC last year there were representatives of 35 different operators. 
Cabot was not in the room. And every one of those operators took Cabot to task for all the stupid things that they did in Dimmick. We would never do something like that. Three months later, Chesapeake, $700,000 fine, 34 families. Whoops. It can happen to all of them. It happens to the best of them. It happens to the worst of them. It's just too darn difficult to make it perfect. It will never be perfect. So you accept what they call rare, or you don't accept what they call rare. The only way to make it more rare is to not do it. Okay. Um, that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, Dr. Ngraffi will be here the rest of the day. So if, there, uh, if you have specific questions, I'm sure we can, uh, he'll be available to answer. And some of your questions will be answered in uh, later sessions, uh, particularly questions about the effect of Act 13, the new Oil and Gas Act um, on Pennsylvania. Um, well, thank you for attending, and there's another session starting in a couple of minutes here. Thank you here. very much. Yeah. Thank you. Just a couple of quick announcements. Um, the next sessions start at 11. Uh, the environmental impacts talk will be right in here. The media and messaging talk will be in this building in room 101. I'm running it. I don't know where it is. We'll figure it out together. And uh, the legislative and regulatory issues uh, session is in the student life zone, which is that building right across from this building where the exhibits are also. It's in that same area where the exhibits are, if you've already seen the exhibits. 